This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV This Week in Virology, episode 515, recorded on October 12th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Good afternoon, Vincent. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. No fishing this week. Not this week, but Sunday I'm going fishing. Definitely. You are? Yeah, sure. This is perfect weather for this now. Well, we can't mention the W word. We can't. That's too bad. Do whatever you That's want, That's really actually. too bad. It's beautiful out I'm there. I'm just going to say that it's been humid for 10 days and today's not. That's right. <laughs> also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's um, it is blustery here. It's, uh, nobody cares. Fahrenheit nobody cares. I know nobody cares, but I care. <laughs> Great flying weather for light aircraft. <laughs> uh, yeah, you kind of go blowing all over the place in exactly. the planes I fly. So. Yeah, yeah. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Howdy, everybody. How you doing? Howdy. Howdy. He's the, adopting a Southern Texas accent. You think you've been there long said, enough? I've, uh, I think I've said howdy before I even got here. He said it in yeah. Austin. Uh, that was a preemptive. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, every day that goes by, every week that goes by, I am more and more an Austinite. <laughs> we'll see in uh, 10 years so. if you have a twang. Uh, uh, that's not going to happen. At any rate, mm. I, have to, I, I want to report... That it is 81 degrees Fahrenheit, 27 uh, Celsius, and a couple of clouds, but otherwise bright blue sky. It's gorgeous. Right. Nice. Nice. Also joining us from southeastern myth- Michigan, Kathy Michigan? Spindler. Mi- it's not a myth. <laughs> myth. Michigan. <laughs> Hi. It's great here. Uh, it's a little bit cloudy, and we've had some cold weather. It's now 46 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 8 that degrees Celsius. Is, <laughs> that is wow. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's just as much colder here as it had <laughs> been humid in the city. So it's 60 and sunny now. Are we going to get wind tomorrow? Is that the idea? Well, I think so. We had a lot of wind this morning. Yeah. Like I can say one thing. You, you, you keep raising the specter of people objecting to us talking about the weather on this show when we open. Well, it's not a and specter. It's, it's a actually fact. It's actually not true that you, they should diss this thing, though, because we're marking the end of the transmission for West Nile virus in this country for this year. The, the moment the cold weather great. sets in, yeah, but mosquito doesn't, it's not production. cold in uh, Texas, as you heard. It's, well, it's going it's to be cold down there. It will be cold down there. Doesn't yeah, actually, mosquito... next week. Actually, next week, it's uh, there's a couple of days forecast with highs in the fifties. Look at that. So, what is the temperature at which the mosquitoes go to sleep, Dixon? Well, it has to get colder, but they get an idea about sleeping right now. They get they're yawning. Even in Florida, <laughs> South Florida, mosquitoes got it. Well, some. Yeah, that's right. Sometimes they they can have a bad idea. Now they don't die. Now. They winter over. That's what they do. They winter over. Mm. All right, we have a bunch of things to tell you about today. In addition to science, first of all, we remind you that the deadline for applying to the C phages program, and you have to be a a school to apply, and a high school (laughs) is approaching October 31st, and this is a program to explore genetic diversity of phages. Students get to isolate phages and name them. And so uh, this is a great program that has been going on for Many years, 130 institutions, 5,000 students a year are participating. Wait, well, so they have to be a high school? Undergraduates? No, it's undergrads. I said, undergrads. Un- I said the same thing last week, and I was yes. corrected, and I made the same mistake. It's colleges. Well, you're colleges. lucky you because you get to edit this show. <laughs> I don't edit that. But, you know, the thing is, it would be good in high schools as well. It would be. But right now they're taking applications from colleges. Yeah, these are for colleges. Mm -hmm. So uh, go for it. You can find out at uh, hhmi.org slash SEA or info at cphages.org. And I'm sorry to tell everyone that Tom Stites died this week. Oh. 78 years old. Tom Stites, 
Nobel laureate for helping for mm. for figuring out the structure of the ribosome. And mm. uh, that was back in 2009 with two other individuals. And there's a very nice um, obituary over at the New York Times. And it's really, it's by Gina Collada, really nicely written. The one thing I, I just thought of reading it is that she probably wrote this months ago and years ago. And, you know, they store these things for, right. for when. Sure. And I think one year they released Steve Jobs' obituary by mistake. That's happened a couple of times there. Yeah. Mark Twain once. Didn't he say? Sure. What did he say? He the said rumors? The, the rumors of my death were greatly exaggerated. Hey, so it's a really good obit. Read it. And what I just thought of when I saw this uh, in the other day is that when we had Joan Stites, of course, his wife on TWIV at ASV, I first asked her, who would you like to have dinner with? First person she said, my husband. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel sad that she's lost her dinner companion. Uh, well, absolutely. It happens, right? It does. Uh, I just want to say that uh, Tom was uh, a good friend in particular when uh, I was in Joan's lab years ago. And uh, Joan and Tom were, uh, you know, really, really good to us. And we uh, spent time with them not only while I was in graduate school, but uh, as uh, time went on, uh, less and less as the years go on, of course. But uh, immediately afterwards, uh, when I was uh, doing a postdoc in uh, England, Joan and Tom were doing a sabbatical uh, in Germany. And uh, we... Uh, they visited us in England. We visited them in Germany. There was a meeting in Grindelwald in Switzerland that Joan and I uh, mostly attended the meeting while Tom and uh, my wife, Ibby, uh, hiked around the mountains. I think they got the better, they got <laughs> nice. the better deal. Nice. <laughs> uh, but they were, uh, Tom was a wonderful person. Sounds uh, like it from and, this uh, year. Yeah. yeah, and it's uh, sad to see him go. And I wish Joan all the best. It says here, Dr. Stites's career was a golden one, advanced by what turned out to be the right decisions at every turn. Wow. Um, and he said, Dixon, this is for you. It's not just being a great scientist, he said in an interview. It's being an artist. Ooh. Yeah, and I, uh, uh, it's uh, worth pointing out, too, the w w thing that Joan has talked about before, uh, about Tom's uh, support of her career. Um, uh, it's pointed out in one of the obituaries that I read about, uh, when they were looking for jobs and, uh, uh, Tom was offered an assistant professorship at, uh, Berkeley, uh, and, uh, their attitude towards Joan was that, oh, the spouses, uh, female spouses around here are all laboratory assistants, uh, <laughs> while, uh, Yale offered them both, uh, assistant professorships. And so they went to Yale and, uh. You know, right. uh, time was time was very supportive of her career the whole way along. Wow. Hmm. All right, uh, I would like to say hello to a few of the Belgians I met a couple of weeks ago, in of all places, Belgium. Wow, <laughs> radical. <laughs> I mean, amazing, right? Yeah. And uh, this is at the Double Stranded RNA Virus Symposium in Hufalies, at which we recorded a twiv with Harry Greenberg. So, Rich, if you've always wanted to hear Harry, listen to yeah. it. It's really good. He really says some cool things about his early career. It Harry's is a good awesome. one. I like um, it. It's a good one. Yana, Sebastian, and Lean, they're all in Yele's lab. Um, and I, I interacted with Yana and Lean. They were both at the airport. We had to meet them to be picked up by the bus. Sebastian, I signed something for him. He was in the lab. He couldn't make it. So hello to all of you. And I met, so a guy got up and gave a talk about double-stranded RNA viruses of salmon. His name was Oystein. Does, does that remind anyone of anything? Oystein. Oysters. No. <laughs> right? Like 20, That's what I was going to say. <laughs> like seven years ago, we got an email from his girlfriend. She said, it's his birthday. Can you send him a video? <laughs> and then when he defended, she did the same thing. And this is, I said, uh, Oystein, wow. man, is this the same guy? Wow. And so I went uh, to his poster, and sure enough, it was. So hello, Oystein. And I also got a present during that twiv, a uh, a work of art from Heli. That's lovely. And it's a, um, I, I put it on uh, Instagram this morning, and someone said, oh, an intaglio print, which made me go look it up. And this is where you 
scrape, you, you cut in the, the picture and you put ink on it and right. wipe it off, right? And it soaks oh, okay. into the cuts. Okay. I didn't know that, but it's a cell, looks like a cell being infected with it. Yeah, when you're making intaglio prints, there's yeah. no relief in sight. There's no relief. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's very nice. Thank you, Helle. And um, it's very big. And so he sent it to me because I couldn't carry it. Lovely. But it's signed in pencil, so it's an original by... Um, <sighs> Uh, oh, man, I'm going to just massacre this. A N J E is the first name. Ang. Anya. 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 And the last name is C L A E Y, Clay. Clay. Mm-hmm. And so you can go to the website, anyaclay.be. It's called The Art of Connection Art S- Things and Soul Food. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's bioart.eu, also. That's another one. Handmade prints and workshops. Nice. This is cool. Print this paper. is really nice. It's very beautiful. Nice. Thank you, Helle. And um, okay, cool. Follow ups, news. Harold writes, greeting here in cubicle land. <laughs> it is a comfortable 74F with 60% relative humidity. Bright LED lights provide constant <laughs> indirect illumination. <laughs> Sounds like a plant. <laughs> I've been reading about the recent increase of cases of acute flaccid myelitis in the popular press. Is it caused by a virus? The press has been hyping the polio-like symptoms. Yeah. Seem to be clusters of cases in Seattle and Pittsburgh. And opinions on what this might be? I'll hang up and listen to your response. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Acute flaccid paralysis or acute flaccid myelitis is now tracked by the CDC. You can go there and see uh, the latest, and it seems to be cyclical. There was a a spike in 2014 and in 2016, so it looks like we're due for a spike, and indeed we're having a spike. So this condition, which was originally defined by WHO to try and use it for polio surveillance— uh, they, they said any anyone under 15 with weakness in one or more limbs is AFP. And then recently, CDC redefined it to try and deal with these infectious causes. So AFP can be caused by infectious diseases. It can be caused by environmental issues, neurotoxins. Most of these cases that we see, and there are thousands in India, thousands, you never figure out what causes them. Now, in the U.S. in 2014, a number of these coincided with an outbreak of enterovirus D68, which is a respiratory pathogen. So there's some thought that that might be causing at least some of them. And we don't know yet about in this particular outbreak if uh, any of them are caused by EV D68. Mm-hmm. Apparently, uh, in the Colorado cases, nine of them have been linked to um, EV A71. This year? This year. Mm. Yeah, so there are uh, a couple of enteroviruses. Yeah, so they've had, Colorado's had 14 cases. Nine of them have tested positive for A71, which, you know, may may be linked, but. Yeah. So we, um, there's a very good paper, by the way, on AFP. It's called AFP and Enteroviral Infections, which tells you all you wanted to know. Like how to diagnose it, how to differential diagnose it, what can cause it, all the different viruses, all the other things. So if you want to learn more, there you go. I have a local newspaper in my town, um, which is called The Patch. And even they are reporting it because there are a few cases in New Jersey. My little local rag is talking about viruses, which I usually throw away. But uh, here we go. But the people that work at the paper are journalists nonetheless. And yes. We don't want to run them down. I do. I do. Because they, they are. <laughs> now, this is actually not bad because they say reasonable things. Although they always put polio like in the headline. And That's every place. That's everybody does that. <clears throat> a lot of them. Everybody these, reports on this. Yeah, they, is saying that. They pick stories up from Reuters and places like that, and then they reword them. And sometimes when they do, they, they miss the point. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. actually, what's happened in the local news industry <clears throat> since the. Uh, since the wide-scale collapse of the newspaper industry, yeah, right. <laughs> is that uh, a lot of these things are being written more or less centrally and then distributed locally. Yes. Mm. Hyper-local news. You know, what I, you know what else I didn't know is that the New York Times has an op-ed page, and on the op-ed page, you know, it's, it's varied, of course. It's uh, leaning towards the left-central portion of politics. And I, I actually had one once called uh, Farming Up. Uh, the farm at the top or something like this. 
Those things are for sale and they sell them and people buy them all over the world, not just for one day, not just for a week, for years. And I keep getting checks from the New York Times for, you know, small amounts of money, but nonetheless. So that's another way for this stuff to go around the world, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're ever tempted to write an op-ed piece and you think, ah, you know, what the heck, you could you could actually do a lot of good with it. I got a, had a guy contact me years ago. So we'd like to syndicate your blog content. We'll pay you for it. Okay, sure. You know what I get every quarter? <laughs> One cent. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't lying exactly. They don't even send you a quarter for the quarter. Why don't they? <laughs> Gee, a cent. That's like insulting. Oh, my gosh. Um, that is so insulting. back in 2014 when this – Start. It was actually an outbreak in Colorado that was had some acute flaccid paralysis. Was linked to EVD sixty eight at the time. We started working on the virus, and we continue to work on it. And uh, we have a paper in BioArchive, which is yeah. have been in review for a long time. <laughs> so this shows uh, that all the isolates we collected from nineteen sixty two to the present are able to infect uh, neural cells, mm. and. The, the reviewers asked us for some new pictures, which is completely fine. And to do that, we have to take mouse brains and slice them and put them in culture. For the last year, every pup that has been born in our facility has been eaten by the mother. Oh. No. Every pup. We have not been able to do these experiments because of that. All right. And it's not us here only. Other people are having the problem. But we haven't been able to generate a single new picture and, you know, the journal said, well, you know, you're going to have to just resubmit this now because it's so old. And it's, it's just. I hate it when that happens. Ah. I, I really do. I, that, that's ridiculous. I, I think they were right that the pictures weren't as good as they could be. And that's fine. But, man, you were. I like hel- cell cultures, monolayers in plastic dishes, <laughs> man. And <laughs> they grow. Yeah. <laughs> of course, when they get contaminated, then you can. <laughs> Also, there's always something to complain about. You discover new fungus. Come on, <laughs> fungus. So one day we'll get that published. But uh, I think it's kind of interesting. All right, Ebola man continues oh, yeah. in the DRC. Now, is this the continuation of that second outbreak we reported on way back in August? Does anyone know? I think it is. I don't think that one was ever fully under control. Yeah, that's what um, I think too. Mm-hmm. 181 cases and 115 deaths. This is in the North Kivu province. And they say the factors contributing to the continued outbreak is uh, people don't want to listen to the regular, say, don't have these burial ceremonies, you know, where you touch the body and process it and all that yourselves. And they don't want to be vaccinated because mm-hmm. they have a vaccine, which they will put in areas where there are cases, Right. Is it proof that it actually works? <sighs> well, it, the, the clinical Not trial didn't finish. because it Proved, exactly. Yeah, so right. it looked pretty good. We, right. we did talk about that. It right. looked good. So they want to keep using it. And it's a lot of people don't want it. Well, mm-hmm. to put this in context, what's going on in the DRC right now is a horrific civil war. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And it the place is in chaos and people are running around murdering people. And in the midst of all this, there's this outbreak of this horrible disease. And now some authority figure comes around and tells you to get a shot. And, uh, yeah, people yeah, are isn't, just. Isn't this the first one in one of the conflict zones in the DRC? The first outbreak? I think this is this is the first time it's gotten actually into the war zone. <clears throat> um, and, and it's just, you know, how do you even deal with this against that backdrop when it's so hard to deal with against the baseline poverty and the other problems in that area? Um, and, and now you've got a, a war going on and it's, uh, it's a real mess. They have immunized 15,000 people though. Yes, yeah, they have a lot. It's good. Yeah. But, and the, know. um, the hmm. vaccine say when you say it's, what, is it proven? That's a pretty high bar. Um, there is evidence that it may have helped mitigate some of the previous outbreaks in which it was used, but it's being used, of course, I mean, for ethical reasons, you can't have a control village that you don't vaccinate and, you know, no. that kind of thing. No. So um, there, there is there is evidence that it is useful, um, but that's against the background of a whole bunch of other interventions that are inevitably going on at the same time. 
I'll remind yeah, my you. sense is uh, I don't, yeah, my sense is that it's it's not as if there's evidence that it's not useful. It's just that the the data are hard to get. Yes, you know the the way the the way the uh, studies are done, it's hard to get really uh, conclusive uh, conclusive data on the efficacy. And there is no evidence that it's harmful. Yes, right. right. So critically, I mean, if I were in a, a zone where Ebola was breaking out and and trusted the person who was giving the shot, then I would certainly get this thing. Sure, absolutely. Um, but, uh, but that's in, in this context, that's going to be, uh, that's going to be hard. I'll remind you, Dixon, it was tested in the big outbreak in West Africa. Right. In a kind of modified ring vaccination strategy where they try to contain it. And it was an outbreak. Sure. If there was a case, they would immunize yeah. all the contacts, all the healthcare workers, the family. Right. And as a control, they would select half of the people and delay vaccination by three weeks. That was the con- instead of giving a placebo, they decided to do that. And we we talked about it. it looked okay, but then all of a sudden the the outbreak stopped, and so they couldn't finish collecting data. So right. there was another element of control, as as I recall, in that there were uh, quite a few people who were offered the vaccination who refused it. Okay, and I think they were mm-hmm. they were counted into the data as well. Yeah. Yep, that'll do it. That is a control. Okay, let's move on to some papers. Mm-hmm. The, as Mark Chrislip says, the literature. <laughs> and the first one, uh, Rich sent a couple of weeks ago, and then he went away. So I said, all right, when you decide to come back, we can talk about this. So here we go, Rich. What's here I am. What do you got? Uh, so this would fly under most people's radar, I think. <laughs> but uh, my radar mm-hmm. is tuned to this kind of thing. This is a case report in the International Journal of Infectious Diseases uh, from some individuals associated with uh, a hospital uh, in Nanking, Nanjing Medical University. Uh, the authors are Jai Lu, and uh, uh, that's the uh, corresponding author, and uh, the lead authors are Hu, Yang, and Zhuang. Uh, and uh, uh, the bottom line is that it uh, reports a respiratory infection uh, with vaccinia virus uh, in, a, in four uh, individuals. Um, and it is of interest to me uh, because um, uh, most uh, there are no other uh, reports in the literature of respiratory infections with humans in vaccinia. So uh, this to me is as much a public service announcement as it is a snippet, okay, in that this can happen. Yes. Um, so uh, the background on this is kind of interesting. The individuals yeah. who were affected. Yeah, <laughs> to put it mildly. <laughs> I, were, I kept having to read things over and over again. And be like, Wait, yeah. what? They were doing what did I just say? What? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they were in the uh, in the early stages of preparation of what I would categorize as a uh, probably a traditional Chinese medicine called analgesine. And analgesine not its traditional Chinese name, uh, right? <laughs> analgesine is a is an extract of rabbit skin that has been uh, inflamed, as they say, with uh, by a vaccinia virus infection. So apparently they, and, and the, the details on this are vague, uh, but apparently they somehow inoculate a rabbit with, and this has been going on for centuries, right? They somehow inoculate a rabbit with vaccinia virus, which by the way, I haven't mentioned it yet, is the virus that was used as a smallpox vaccine. And uh, I guess from what I can tell, they wait until the skin is actually showing uh, lesions, like would be pox, maybe early in the cycle, I'm not sure. Uh, And then they uh, harvest the skin and send it off for processing. And it shows up at this processing facility where they were doing this as a dried preparation. And the individuals who were processing it uh, were grinding it into a powder, completely unaware of the fact that it was a material that was probably loaded 
with vaccinia virus, and so they took no precautions whatsoever. Further down the line, there's some other kind of extraction, further extraction that's done. And this stuff is administered in multiple different forms. I think it can be injected as a liquid. I think it can uh, show up as a pill. Uh, the extractions must remove the infectivity. Otherwise, I don't think this would be a very popular remedy. Um, and it's prescribed, it's prescribed for lower back pain. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, it is it is uh, approved in China, and as far as I can tell, only in China um, for lower back pain. Lower and uh, back. the the website is interesting. I, I initially I thought this was a traditional remedy, but their marketing material is trying to make it sound all modern, despite the mm-hmm. fact that you're basically ingesting or injecting ground up rabbit pelt. Um, right. And they're talking about uh, how our main product is analgesine, a biotechnologically created drug that is proven to improve various symptoms, yada, yada, yada. So Color me. Sk- really- Got me was, you know, it, it reading along like a typical case report, you know, at the time of admission, yeah. we collected serum, blah, 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 blah. And then the next sentence, the owner of the rabbit skin. Was rabbit skin. <laughs> and I was just sort of baffled all of a sudden. Remarkable. Hey, Ray, color me skeptical about it, well, Algesine. Yeah. So I, I'm still having trouble with this. Was it that they chose a rabbit pelt intentionally? That was... Injected with vaccinia? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think this is this is part, part, of, of, part of the preparation, preparation. process. Yeah, they, yeah. this is okay. the standard preparation. So you take a rabbit, you infect it um, dermally with vaccinia till it develops lesions. You kill the rabbit, you skin it, and then you grind up the skin into a powder, and that's what these guys were doing. Right, and then the English trade name for it is extracts from rabbit skin inflamed by vaccinia virus. Yes, <laughs> which nice, is nice catchy descriptive. name. Nice catchy name. <laughs> Yeah. No pun intended. But, and then <laughs> the owner of the skin was only able to provide the information that the rabbit was contaminated with vaccine right. virus, where they right. probably mean injected or intentionally infected, yeah, they, not uh, they, contaminated. So the word yes. confused me. Right. Okay. They, uh, they say here, we describe the uh, skin as contaminated by vaccine virus. Okay. They're, so they're saying, you know, we've chosen the the, the best word we could come up with <laughs> right. under the circumstances. Yeah. The one thing I want to know though, does it work? <laughs> well, you certainly uh, get vaccinia virus out of it. No, no, actually you can For find a, uh, does your low, yes. does your lower back pain go away? Uh, you can find a, uh, what is touted to be a con- uh, controlled clinical uh, trial on this, that attests to the uh, efficacy. I did not look at the, that particular study right. in any detail right so let me inject here just uh, uh, to yeah, knock down topical. the it's topical the, the humor <laughs> level i want to lower it a little bit because you can be skeptical about a lot of things um but you would be skeptical too if you didn't know what was going on when you saw people taking frog skins and applying them to various parts of their body like their eye and well, like their eye or like a lesion or things like mm. this and you'd say what the hell is going on here and it's yeah, no, no. it's we're, traditional we're medicine just, that takes just, advantage uh, of mcgainan's which could are be. proven. Could be. No, I don't say it's going on here, but could be um, cytokines. Could be a lot of things. It could yeah. be a lot of things, and it could actually have some efficacy. But there's obviously a. Um, I'm just remarkable. I'm remarking at the no, I, lack of safety in the. Got it. Plant, I, know, right? I got yes. it. I got it. I got it. I got it. And what role does the virus play in making this thing work? Why not just I, I make think normal? Traditional, this stuff is fine. Uh, it happens so much. We don't see much. But this is the part that's too bad that they they work and they don't have any. Continuity. Maybe in the old days when they did this, they were using it for a scarification. Okay. Go ahead, Rich. So at any rate, um, uh, uh, the uh, individuals who became ill showed up with fever, chest tightness, respiratory failure, uh, and occasional lesions in various uh, parts of their body. And uh, uh, appropriate scans and x-rays showed uh, focal lesions uh, in their lungs. These were workers, and right? These were workers. These are the guys who were, who right. were grinding up the rabbit skin right. without any precautions because they didn't know it was uh, had vaccinia virus in it. Um, so, and so, so rich, they say four of the five had been vaccinated against smallpox. So, right. Um, as children, as children. As children. So, so how, were they old enough? So that was before mm-hmm. eradication mm-hmm. or right. when did they stop vaccinating uh, yeah. in China? 
uh, before uh, the that fifth, I, before the fifth patient uh, was growing I think up. It's, I think <laughs> they say eighty one in the the uh, first paragraph. Okay. Okay. So, yes. so uh, yeah. So um, and they did appropriate tests to uh, show that it was vaccinia virus that they were infected with. Uh, and all of these, they were given supportive care, and all of these cases uh, resolved spontaneously over a period of time. The rabbit is still um, dead, though. The rabbit is dead. Yeah. So um, the the here's the public service part of this. Uh, if you're uh, working on vaccinia or have any interest in it, and you look into the literature, what you come away with is the impression that it can only be acquired in humans uh, as uh, through um, uh, contact direct contact with the virus in an open wound in the skin or in a mucous membrane, the, uh, for example, the eye uh, or, or in the mouth. Um, and that leaves you with the impression that if you take appropriate precautions against that, you're not going to get infected. Uh, and this is the first published report of uh, people getting a respiratory infection with the virus. And I can corroborate this because we had a respiratory infection in my laboratory uh, some decades ago that was uh, mighty scary. Um, we were using a process for uh, fixing a, a large number of infected dishes that was not uh, completely, ultimately, we figured out, not completely effective in inactivating uh, the virus. And the procedure that we were using exposed the uh, workers to uh, aerosols. And one of them uh, got a respiratory infection with the virus that had this these same symptoms, uh, fever, um, chest tightness. Uh, the individual on x-ray had a really large, nasty uh, pneumonia, focal lesion uh, in the lung, and showed up with um, uh, pox lesions on their uh, ankles uh, and wrists. So they actually had a systemic infection. Wow. Up to that time, and you know, our intention was to publish this, uh, but it, uh, I didn't want to take the lead in that. Uh, we had the CDC down uh, investigating this whole thing. It was. Uh, a pretty scary deal because at the time, uh, the nature of the work we were doing, we couldn't be entirely certain that this was vaccinia. <laughs> it could have been some other pox virus. So it <clears> took <throat> us a day or so to figure out, to confirm that it was actually just vaccinia and not something uh, perhaps nastier. Um, you know, up until that time, we had the the – uh, CDC and the NIH um, recommend that people who are going to work with vaccinia be vaccinated. Uh, but the actual decision as to what to do is left up to the local institutions. And up until that time, uh, we had a policy that was uh, actually uh, put together. I, I actually spearheaded the campaign to do this. That was a waiver policy where you were you were informed of what the hazards were, and um, you could elect whether or not you wanted to be vaccinated. And this was done with the full support of our uh, biosafety people and everything else. It was all well researched, and we had legal people involved and everything else. Uh, and then, uh, and you know, part of that was the description that. You know, we can avoid infection by taking appropriate precautions and not getting the virus in the skin. Uh, and then this happened. And we just, I said, that's it. Everybody's getting vaccinated. <laughs> and we changed the policy. And that's, that's it. So, so so why were these individuals, four or five, were vaccinated? So why did they become Well, they, they were vaccinated probably as children. Yeah, right. Pre 1980, and the vax, the vax, this is important. The that vaccination of efficacy, it's documented, can wane over time. Mm. Okay, had they not been vaccinated, they could, they might possibly have been worse off. Though apparently one of them uh, was uh, vaccine uh, naive. Mm. Uh, so that's why even you know if you're uh, a, a 
vaccination policy uh, at our university had you be revaccinated. I think it was every five years or so. I, uh, I was trying to remember if it was every five or every 10. One of the two. Uh, different places will have different policies. I yeah. think the the public health policy is probably one every 10 years hmm. uh, or used to be for a, a smallpox vaccine. It's it's very interesting how different um, different institutions are and how strict they were. Yep. They are with this. Um, the first place I worked, we we had a waiver policy where most people were able to waive it, and then the next place I worked, they were appalled that I had vaccine experience without uh, vaccination and was marched right in to get a vaccine. Right. Mm. Well, this certainly uh, the uh, th that experience for me in uh, our laboratory sure, certainly. Uh, changed my mind because I didn't want to deal with anything like that ever again. It, that was uh, that was scary, and I'm uh, sorry that in the end that that didn't get published because I think it's important that uh, people know about. I mean, it's, if you think about it, it's obvious people infect animals with vaccinia all the time, right? Uh, through the uh, respiratory route, and they get lung infections. Like, duh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, and I no there's there's the classic technique of variolation, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the dogma has been that you don't get a respiratory infection. Well, here it is. You can. You and can. it's now published. And you knew so that when you're already. Grinding up rabbit, rabbit. I knew uh, that already, and that's one of the mouse. reasons that I that I really uh, that I really zeroed in on that was because on this because I was happy to see it published. So when people are working out, they really should be vaccinated. I right? think so. Yeah. And you know what? These five guys are vaccinated now. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, in space. Oh, yeah. They're well. They're well vaccinated. Yeah. Oh, it's a and they all, they all recovered, right, Rich? Yeah. Yes. Wouldn't they you, all recovered. Wouldn't you say as did As did the worker in my <laughs> laboratory. It was perfectly healthy. Yes, Dixon. Wouldn't you say that it's a miracle that others hadn't popped up before this because it's a traditional medicine that's prepared in exactly this way? Uh, Where are those other people? I don't know about miracles, Dixon. Well, do you believe in miracles? <laughs> I know the song. <laughs> I'm not sure which parts of this are traditional. <laughs> oh. I mean, Vincent Vincent pointed is, says it's probably a traditional medicine. I don't know that it necessarily is, or if this is derived from some other traditional medicine process. If right. vaccinia was originally the part of the process, or okay. what this came from, so I don't know. <clears throat> do we know how long this particular procedure has been in operation? Don't know. That would be a good question to ask. Because that's what's, it's the combination of vaccinia sure. and grinding stuff up into a exactly, powder exactly. that finally gave this exposure. Exactly. And, and if mm -hmm. part of that was missing, then you wouldn't have this type of exposure. You will recall that the uh, outbreak that, that allowed Hamilton, Montana to get on the map with regards to NIH occurred in a, a group of people looking for the causes of Rocky Mountain mm -hmm. spotted fever. Right. And they ground up ticks and they got sick and they died. And that scared the hell out of them. Ticks. <laughs> they ground up yeah, ticks. That's right. That's the way to do it. You know, Rich, you mentioned that you in your lab you were staining plates. And uh, I'm looking at Dixon. He's, he's sitting in front of 1,600 stained <laughs> plates of polio. And I can't believe how short a time that took to make those plates like that. You said that's two days' work. <laughs> you get into a rhythm. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you, the experiments that we were doing at the time could easily have uh, generated a wall of vaccinia. That's amazing. Yeah, I'm sure you did many times over. Yeah. Wow. But they're gone. I used no, to measure my... just Some people always ask me, is there a virus in them? <laughs> <laughs> I used to measure my progress in my laboratory by the number of pepsin jars that i went through per year pepsin jars <laughs> pepsin because yeah. i used it to digest the the mice to get the larvae out all right thank you rich this is very cool sure. very cool all right we're going to move on to a, a paper it was published in cell which comes from yale university and yale school of medicine the home of the stites as we were just saying mm. and it's called cell penetrating peptide mediates intracellular membrane passage of human papillomavirus L2 protein to trigger retrograde trafficking. And the authors are Jean Da Silva, Detheridge, Bird, and Dan DeMaio, who all of us probably know except Dixon. No, no I don't know. You don't know the virologists? Not well. I used to know for some. many years. I used to know for some. many years. So this is all about human papillomaviruses. I thought it's time to give a, a DNA virus a little time. We do tend to 
focus on RNA viruses here on Twitter. I don't know why, but Gee. or a small DNA virus. A small DNA a small virus. DNA. Just yeah. super pox. We yeah. we do uh we do big ones now and then. Is this a yeah. single or a double stranded? It's a double stranded. Double stranded. D- double stranded and, circle. Yes. And okay. so Kathy, that's a good point. Two DNA viruses in this episode. Oh. We're getting a little risky here. I, oh. Hey, hey. I like it. <laughs> Just got to get some DNA sensing and I'll be. <laughs> We've done that. We've done that. We do it when it's uh, popping up. Double and DNA unenveloped. Unenveloped. Nice little capsid built with icosahedral symmetry. 5%. These are human papillomaviruses. 5% of human cancers, cervical cancers, and others. We have a great vaccine that can be used to prevent them. Does that include this particular strain of virus? Mm-hmm. So, okay. Yeah. The L2? No, the L2 is a protein. Yeah, I know that, but does do all the papillomaviruses contain L2? Or oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. They do oh, yeah. It's highly okay. conserved. They all contain all right, L2, right. but they, and, don't all, uh, yeah. they don't all Pap- cause cervical cancer, Dixon. Right. right. Okay. Papillomavirus's day job is warts. Warts. You, you want to see one? Fact, no, most- I don't want to see. Get out of here. <laughs> right over there. <laughs> no, right there. TMI. I got, oh, I didn't. <laughs> this was in a public place that you could see this. <laughs> I'm not saying what he just did, folks. It's, it's on my It's on my bicep. <laughs> TMI, uh, Warts Up, uh, Doc. That was a title we didn't use before, right? We did, but we could now. Warts Up, Doc. That was from Michelle, what's her name? Osborne. Uh, uh, Os- Michelle Osborne. Osborne. At University of New Mexico. HPV virus particle. So it's an 8-kilobase double-stranded circular DNA genome. The, the capsid has a major protein called L1 and 72 copies of L2, Dixon. Wow, must be important. Which are buried, but are really important, as we're going to see today. Yeah, yeah. And these viruses bind receptors, and they're trafficked to the nucleus, and they're they're kept in vesicles the whole way, because as as Brianne will say, otherwise they would be their DNA would be detected. Bingo. Exactly. So they hide it. It's really cool. They stay in vesicles. They go into endosomes, and then they they're targeted to the trans Golgi, and eventually they make their way into the nucleus. And that targeting is what we're going to talk about today which is really, really cool. They've really sorted out what's going on. Right, so they're traveling through the retrograde transport pathway, which goes to the nucleus, and the anterograde pathway goes away That's from right. the nucleus. That's right. So the, the, pathway- cell has, the cell has reasons to recycle proteins from the yes. membrane under <clears throat> normal <throat> circumstances and reuse them, and that involves the retrograde transport, which would take proteins from the membrane and take them back towards the nucleus and recycle. And as you might guess, there are cell proteins that are involved in this trafficking. And there's one which features in this paper. It's called Retromer. Appropriately. (laughs) Now, I would like to take just 10 seconds to express my dismay at calling them retrograde transport factors when, in fact, Retromer is a protein. So as Ann Scalke likes to say, if it's a protein, please call it a protein, not a factor. But retromer is one of the proteins important for retrograde transport, and it's essential for transport of the HPV virus particle to the trans-Golgi network. It's a good name, right? Retromer, like reverse transcriptase, yeah. retro, retro. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the, the, the somehow the virus movement requires this protein, and we're going to see in, in this paper how. Now, it's been previously known that this retromer binds a carboxy terminal part of the L2 protein. Remember Dixon, the capsid protein L2? I, I'm sorry, would you please? And if you, knock down, <laughs> if you knock down retromer, you impair um, oh, I got movement. The, the, the particles, the virus particles remain in the endosome, so they right. never get to the trans-Golgi. Right. No, I read this paper, and I, I was very impressed with the way in which this particular virus takes advantage of an existing system to subvert a normal process to its own will. Isn't that that's what viruses do? Man. Isn't that what viruses do? Yeah, but do this is so clear, the way they well, describe it. Well, that's because you read it. Well, no, no. Some of these papers I don't understand at all. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, but this Dixon's one I understand pretty it, well. It is, it is very ma- well done. Yeah. Dixon making a point that I wanted to make. Dan DeMeo gives absolutely the clearest and best talks you have ever imagine. heard. I can and it shows up in the paper. So many of these papers, uh, in particular in these high-profile journals, are right. so dense. They, totally. they They don't explain what they're doing or why or I anything. Agree. And Dan has, uh, Dan's laboratory and uh, his mentorship has 
presented this in a totally understandable fashion. It's just terrific. I, Wonderful I would, to see. I totally agree mm-hmm. with that. Mm-hmm. I do. Mm-hmm. I, do. Yeah. I was just making fun of Dixon. That's okay. It's easy I like to do. Because I like to. It's yeah. easy to do. <laughs> yeah. So here we have this L2 protein, which is in the endosome. And retromer is in the cytosol. So that's a problem, right? Dan calls it a topological challenge. <laughs> it's a topological challenge, right? Yeah. So how does how does the protein interact with retromer, which is outside the endosome? So their hypothesis is that the protein somehow pokes through the endosome somehow. to get in there. And in fact, previously it's been shown that good part of this protein is actually in the cytoplasm during entry. There's just a little transmembrane holding it into the endosome. Dixon is very excited. I, I am. You, no, I am. You can't see him, but he's no, you, really. You realize that I, I spent three years in Chris, Christian Dudu's laboratory. Yes, uh, and he was involved in. He was involved in all of these cellular mechanisms and the Golgi and the, the subcellular particles, et cetera. And this just, for me, I'm just reliving a, a part of my past as a postdoc, just listening to all these wonderful now clearer explanations of what was going on then. So this is bringing me up to date. So that's what we're going to look at in this paper. How does this L2 get to the cytosol during infection, right? Now, we know also from previous work that if you make peptides derived from the carboxy terminus of L2, he says they destabilize membranes at low pH. So that's an interesting clue. So it means that peptides can do something to membranes, right? Yes, um, and-, and I think we should mention how important that is for non-enveloped viruses in general. Um, enveloped viruses can get cro- can get across a membrane pretty easily with fusion. Right. Um, but with non-enveloped viruses, there's often this problem of how do they cross a membrane to get in? I have the answer. The the enveloped viruses get across with fusion, and the non-enveloped viruses get across with confusion. So <laughs> the question is, Dixon, why did the virus cross the membrane? To get uh, to the to get to the to the site of replication to the leaflets associated <laughs> with the tr- <laughs> so L two C terminus has a, a stretch of basic amino acids basic amino acids does it and those are right in the membrane destabilizing peptide right right and these this sequence resembles a, a class of peptides called cationic cell penetrating peptides there you go which you can add to cells and they will help transport proteins across. Membranes are very cool. I remember years ago hearing about one of the herpes virus. I think it's VP22, if I'm not mistaken. Does that ring a bell, Rich or Kathy? A little peptide you can add to cells and it gets in. Tat protein of HIV can do similar things. There, there are also cell proteins that do that as well. They can cross membranes. People are trying to figure out how to use those therapeutically because right. Right? you can attach cargo to them. Right. And so the the bottom line in this paper is that this – CPP at <laughs> the C terminus of L2 is what gets it through the endosome membrane so it can interact with retromer and move on to the transgolgi. But it's not involved in attachment. It's not involved no. in attachment. Yeah, do you That's remember that important... experiment? Yeah. Well, sure, because it's, you yeah. know, you would just guess that it, it yeah, hits yeah. the cell, you know, but it's So if you make a mutant that can't attach, you can't study this. Right? Exactly. exactly. Yeah, because it never gets to that point. Right. So the methods here are just gorgeous. They are. And, you know, mm-hmm. they're presented beautifully. They're controlled. And uh, it, it's The lovely. visuals of this paper yeah. are incredible. It's, it's unfortunate this is a this is a closed access paper, um, so a lot of our listeners won't be able to get to it. But the figures are lovely, and they're just, just really Vincent, well-designed experiments presented beautifully. Vincent, this is the greatest example I can give you of the connection between art and science. This is a perfect I blend. I believe it. I believe it. I'm, a not, a, I'm not a naysayer. Blend. Don't worry. When you can see the art of this paper, you see the science. Yes, there is an art to it, for sure. That's right. Now, the, uh, an essential reagent in this paper is, is called a pseudovirus. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has their own name for things. It's right. basically a capsid with DNA in it that can encode for something that you could detect, like green fluorescent protein or whatever it is. <laughs> and this is how we, or they, I don't work on these viruses, study in, infection. Yeah, because ordinarily you can't grow this virus in culture. Right. So they have to come up with this uh, artificial system. So they study parts of the virus 
Well, it's a capsid. Interested. It's a right, capsid. Right, right. What they can do, what they can do, is use a use a system with appropriate transfections where they can put together a capsid that contains L1 and L2 and sure. encapsidates a piece of DNA, which, when uh, transcribed in the cell, uh, results in a uh, fluorescent signal. So it's a reporter. Nice. So nice. why can't you grow this in the channel cells? Uh, that's, uh, an interesting question. The, yes. uh, virus has a very, um, uh, it's, uh, life cycle is very much tied to the differentiation of the epidermis. Okay. So, uh, in oh, okay. epidermis and normal skin, there's a basal cell layer that's actively sure, dividing sure. and the daughter cells from that okay. migrate up through the skin and differentiate dramatically right. as right. they uh, yeah. go up ultimately into these uh, basically dead bags of keratin called keratinocytes that yeah. provide yeah. the really armor at the top. And the virus, uh, its life cycle is uh, rigidly tuned to this where it has an early phase of gene expression in the actively dividing basal cells, but right. you don't make any virus there. It's not until... Uh, so that yields daughter cells, and as they migrate up through the uh, skin, the differentiation in those cells triggers uh, changes in gene expression in the virus. So that in the uh, more upper levels of the skin, now you start to get uh, expression of the later genes of the virus and the capsid proteins and ultimately mature virus. And so in order to get a complete replication cycle, you have to have all of those differentiation stages. Right. And that doesn't, that doesn't happen in so cultures. So organoids don't fill don't, this Can't role? they do raft cultures? They can, you can do raft cultures. So you can make or, essentially an artificial skin starting yeah, yeah. with keratinocytes yeah, at an exactly. air-liquid interface, and you can see the whole cycle uh, happen uh, in those uh, raft cultures. But uh, that's just for observation. You're not going to make a ton of virus to do an okay. experiment on that, mm. and you're not doing any flak assays. Right. <laughs> They'd be ward assays anyway. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Yeah, I think I think that maybe selling short some of the more recent developments, but I can't put my finger on it. I've been trying to find something. We can let, um, we can they, let. they can grow some pretty decent amounts of viruses. Okay. Um, oh, we'll, we'll let them email us, right? Yes. Tell us yeah. I, I, think it, I think it is accurate to say that, that these are not simple systems to deal with. Okay. Mm. So, so we have these pseudoviruses, and you can put fluorescent proteins in, and they do that and show that they can infect cells and they can get a nice signal. And then they they trash this basic segment. It's RKRRKR, okay? Got that? RKRRKR. They replace it with six alanines. Doesn't get in. No fluorescence. And the difference there is that you've, you've changed the chemistry of this domain yeah, exactly. from a basic to, uh, well, alanine has alanines. no side chain. Alanines. So we got six alanines there. This clearly, is essential for infection. They replace it. They replace the sequence with the TAT sequence from HIV, which is a cell penetrating peptide, and it works. Mm. It's really cool. Uh -huh. So they say, "Oh, this this must be a, a CPP at the C terminus that's helping deliver uh, the virus there." And they they replace this sequence with the various numbers of arginines or lysines and um true basic yeah they're basically you, you can replace um you can replace the segment with arginine rich sequences that have no um cpp activity and infectivity basically correlates with your uh, by the way r is arginine and k is lysine exactly <laughs> <laughs> so when vincent was reading off rk rrr that was arginine That's lysine like that. sorry sorry yes I'm so That's used right. to it. Yeah, yeah. Arginine is also a pirate's favorite amino acid. It is. <laughs> <laughs> so now we have this one virus, a pseudovirus with the TAT substituted for this sequence in L2. Is it using the same entry pathway? So they knock down retromer, and in fact, it's inhibited. So it's using the same pathway. They also have a chemical inhibitor of, of an enzyme, gamma secretase, which is important for entry of. HPV, it's called, this is a great one, compound XXI. 
<laughs> and it disinhibits <laughs> name of a movie. Both, like, I don't know if it's a Roman numeral or just no. It's going to be the next iPhone. <laughs> it, it might be. It might excellent, be. Excellent. And this inhibits both the wild type and this TAT hybrid. So it's kind of neat that the two entry requirements, which are the CPP and the secretase, are also um, uh, blocked when you when you inhibit both uh, in this hybrid virus. So okay, that's very cool. Next, um, does this sequence have cell penetrating activity right. by itself? So they take a 28 residue peptide that has this sequence in it, and they conjugate it to a fluorescent dye, Alexa Fluor 488. Those of you who work with these compounds will recognize that. And uh, then they can just add it to cells and say, does it get in by microscopy? And it, wild type peptide gets in. If you put six alanines, it the, does the not. graphics on this were incredible. The, the pictures are beautiful. You can't make yeah. a mistake as to misinterpreting or interpreting this at all. It's all matching, and it's all it's perfect. It's and absolutely you, you perfect. Got, you know what's really? I love Dappy stain because you yeah, yeah, everything's stained. A right. nice blue ocean of nuclei, right? Yeah, I like. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just looks very, very nice. Yeah. I have to say that in the old days, it was really hard to do this. Yep. Lovely microscopy. You didn't for, I mean, microscopes weren't as good, but you didn't have these wonderful floors no. of different excitation wavelengths. That thank you, you Marty Chalfie. <laughs> no, I don't think we can thank Marty for Alexa floor for No, no, but to, to lead the path leading to Alexa floors. <laughs> yeah, well. All right. So um, then they... <laughs> They they produce a protein in bacteria, which is GFP fused to this 28 mm. amino acid peptide, and that gets in cells. So again, they have to engineer it, produce it in bacteria, purify it. It's a lot of work. Put it on cells, gets into cells. The 6-alanine mutation blocks that, or changing to 6-alanine. So, so they're using, it, it, basically what's going on here is they're using different reporters to find the same information and triangulate. Alan, it. you said it, basically. They're tr- yes, basically. <laughs> <laughs> basically what's going on here. That's right. So these all show that this C-terminal segment has cell penetration activity, and it's required for uh, infectivity because they've made changes in it in this pseudovirus, and it doesn't get in. Right. So now the next set of series are, of experiments are cell-binding experiments. They can add virus to cells, pseudovirus at a low temperature, and then raise the temperature and they start getting in as endocytosis begins. Uh, and they have they have a 3R mutant with three arginines. And they use this because the 6-alanine doesn't bind to cells. And so they can't look at the subsequent effect or subsequent effects. But the 3R binds as well as wild type, um, and it's not very good at at getting into the cells. The fact that the six alanine guy doesn't bind well to cells is interesting in its own right. It is very yes. Mm-hmm. They L2 can't really follow be, it up here, but L2 is supposed to be buried, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. So this implies that either that's having some effect on the overall shape of the capsid or that maybe L2 has a little yeah, bit of yeah. presence on the outside during the binding reaction. I sus- right. Yeah, my, my first guess would be a, a capsid shape change because alanine is the smallest amino acid and you've replaced these much larger molecules with that and the L2 is packed into this tight structure. But uh, that would be an interesting thing to so work what, out. So what's, right. what's the net charge on alanine? Ask Zip. Al- ask Alan. Alan, what's the net charge on alanine? <laughs> uh, there isn't one, is there? There isn't one, no. No, there's not. Right. Uh, just and really- in fact, go ahead, go I was ahead. just going to say in the discussion, they say that the simplest explanation for these findings is that L1 is sufficient for binding, but the 6A mutation causes a subtle change in the structure of the capsid right. that inhibits L1 from binding to the receptor. Yes. Mm. Alanine is used as a substitution in many of these experiments because it is, because it is by far the most boring amino acid out there. Yes. <laughs> I thought glycine was. No, glycine no. actually causes mm-hmm. some kinks and stuff like that. Alanine is much more boring than glycine. A- alanine just goes along. I Alan, uh, do you like being part of alanine? I, well, I, I, my wife refers to me as alanine. <laughs> really? Yes. Really? That's great. That's great. That's if you great. get too much of it, are you sent to Alan on? <laughs> How about your daughter? Does she refer to you as Alan? No. Not no, yet. That's strictly. When she goes to college, she will. Yeah. So the 3R mutant 
binds and it can be internalized, in fact, as well as wild type. The 6A doesn't bind well, so it doesn't get internalized because it has a, a binding defect. So what they say is this short basic segment is important for something after binding, All right, which is on the way to the TGN, as you will see. So next, what's happening? Where is it getting hung up? Here, they... They do an assay, the PLA, which is not the Palestine Liberation no. Army. Army. Thank you. I forgot that. It's a long time ago, the last time. Wow, that was quick. Proximity ligation assay. Amazing. This is a cool assay, and you, you, you basically have, you want to say, is something within 40 nanometers of something else, proteins, you can have an antibody to each one, and then there's a, a cross-linking reagent that will cross-link the antibodies if they're within 40 nanometers, essentially. Hmm. And uh, that's that's basically how it works, right? Right. Yeah. Well, it involves DNA and hybridization. Yeah. And I could don't. swear that we had this on TWIV before. But yeah, I think we did talk about it be. on TWIV. But basically, it's a way of. It's it really pretty quote. complicated. It amplifies the signal, and yeah. it's amazing. But you got to—that's a—that's a, a a story in itself. Yeah. So here they want to know they use it as a marker for transit of the of the capsid f from the endosome to the TGN because there are protein markers for each compartment, right? So they have a marker of the early endosome and a marker of the trans Golgi, and so now you can ask the do the altered particles get to each one? So the three R mutant gets in cells and reaches the endosome. Uh, and then um, wild type, of course, gets to the endosome as well. Um, and then after time, like 16 hours, the signal of wild type in the endosome goes down because it's leaving. It's departing for the TGN. The train has left the station. Um, and then the, the mutants have accumulation in the endosome because they can't move on. So they have they have no retromer binding site any longer. The three R mutant, for example, apparently can't bind retromer, so it stays uh, in in the endosome. Someone remind me what's DM again? Double mutant. Double, mute. Double mutant. Double mutant. So that uh -huh. one also stays in the endosome, like the three R as well. And then and that double that double mutant is that because. Ultimately, it's important to point out that we're talking about two components here. One is the cell-penetrating peptide that we've been mostly focusing on, but the mm -hmm. other is this retromer binding sequence That's right. that has That's the right. sequence mm -hmm. FYL. Now, uh, Kathy, is the double mutant uh, so named because it's mutant in both of those? I think so. Uh, yeah, they don't right? really say, but it just says yeah. lacks retromer binding sites. Okay. Right. So those mutants don't make it out of the endosome. And again, they tell this by using this proximity ligation. Oh, wait. Actually, I think the double mutant lacks the two retromer binding sites, but it has the basic sequence. I'm just looking at the sequences now. It has the basic sequence at the end. The CPP. Okay. The CPP. Right. Okay. So if you change either the retromer or the CPP, you don't get to right. the TGN, transgolgi, as measured by proximity ligation assay, right? PLA. PLA. Yes. <laughs> yes exactly. Logs are throwing out letters. There was yeah. a sentence a while back where... Almost everything you said was just letters. Yes. <laughs> Alan, where, did you, find the, where yeah. did you find the double mutant sequence? Uh, figure 5D. Uh, uh, okay. It's wild type 3R and DM. Oh, there it is. Mm -hmm. And DM ah, okay, has the okay, alanines okay, 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 in those two okay. spots. And then, so yeah. I think the important thing here is that if you block retromer association or you take away the penetrating peptide, you remain in the endosome. And that's why they say uh, both events are needed for trafficking to the transgolgi both retromer association and penetration right the ah, thing I, I see okay the, the thing i like so most presumably that double mutant could uh poke through the endosome that's but right since it doesn't have the retromer binding site that's right. that's it's right. not going anywhere it's not going right anywhere. the thing i liked most about this paper was that it wasn't just clear the experiments were yes and no answers Yes. So you can see yeah. whether it worked or didn't work. Is it didn't work or it did work? And there's a blank cell and there's a cell that lights up. Right. And that's so s simple and yet elegant. Okay. Now you may be thinking, I'm not. How thinking. do you know that <laughs> these in these experiments you're not actually binding retromer? So you know you've taken out the retromer binding signal, but you should show it, right? And so that's what they do next. <laughs> the three R mutation does it impair? the association between the capsid and the retromer. So um, they, they again use um, this PLA 
assay, proximity ligation assay. 75% reduction in the signal for the mutant at eight hours, and it decreases further by 16 hours. So they say that the mutation could inhibit retromer association directly mm. or by preventing exposure of the binding sites in the cytoplasm. So they do co, co-association experiments. They call them co-IP or pull-downs, kind of jargony, but they want to know if the, the two can uh, in, interact with each other. So if a cell, forget about the viral infection just for a moment and just take the cell itself, if it doesn't have retromer, what happens to it? It is probably not going to live very long. Yeah, so they I think do that's not going to go well. They they do knockdowns of. <laughs> Are retromer. there diseases? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff comes probably. out of a big study that uh, the DeMeo lab did a while ago with siRNA knockdowns of various cellular components and assessing what effects they mm-hmm. had on mm-hmm. the uh, virus infection. Probably was uh, pseudovirus, and uh, I think this all starts among other things, uh, with uh, an siRNA knockdown yeah, of the retromer right. yeah. and showing that retrograde transport pathway was involved in this. That's right. So that's not a cell missing retromer, but it's a transient knockdown. Right. Transient, yeah. you can right. tolerate right. it. Right. Yeah. And, and and the, if I remember correctly, uh, either Befeldin A or Menensin blocks retrograde transport. Um, and cells are unable to live through more than, uh, say, 16-ish or so hour t- treatment. I always had to be very careful with the treatment times with those drugs. So they die of pollution, basically. They can't get rid of the things that they're trying to get rid of. Is that, is well, retromer, you look at? retromer. Retromer, can't, you can't recycle the proteins. Right, you right, 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 right. Exactly. I, I think you also can't recycle lipids. Um, right. and run out of lipids. Because the gold is associated. Now, here's the That's, question, yeah. whether there are but, human. I just, just a quick PubMed search does show that – more subtle mutations in the retromer complex may be associated with um, late onset Parkinson's disease. Ah, yeah. But those are not, those are not loss of function. Yeah. Because if you have loss of function of it, then I think you, as, as we saw last week, you know, almost all of these proteins, eventually we're going to associate changes in them with human diseases, right? That's what's really cool. Mm -hmm. Exactly, really? exactly. Anyway, in the end, they by these co-IPSs, they find the wild type binds well and the DM mutant binds poorly. DM mutant has a change in the retromer binding right. sequence. Right, so that you would expect. That you would expect. Right. But when you change the um, hydrophobic sequence, it binds retromer just fine. Right. Because that's the idea there is that the defect is in the penetration. Right. Right, getting through. So the, the 3R doesn't interfere with retromer binding. It just can't protrude through the membrane. Right. And now you want to test that. So we're going to do that. <laughs> and they have to develop an entire system. Right. Which is a split green fluorescent protein assay. Right. Where you can take GFP, it's two parts of GFP, yeah. and individually two, two small protein parts are not fluorescent. But when they're brought together, they will fluoresce. So, Did anyone else think of a bacterial protein that's been used like this? Yeah, the uh, um, the <laughs> beta galactosidase, beta, beta gal, and yeah. also oh, the one, uh, beta gal, the one they're, they use for <laughs> for yeast two hybrids too. Right? Yeah, yeah the Venus. Protein. You mm. put together two parts of the protein, and isn't that how you look for protein protein interactions? It's one yes. way you could. Yes. You could do co IPs as as we just did as well. But this is a nice visual way. Or, you know, anyway, they have to develop this, which Beautiful. takes them many paragraphs and do all the proper <laughs> controls. <laughs> Took them so more forth. than just paragraphs. It's kind of like exactly. boasting. <laughs> they have to validate it, which they do. So then they do the experiment, and they take a. Uh, they basically show that um, you can t- fuse one part of the GFP to the C terminus of, of L2, right? And then you can put it into cells. So we've got cells producing part one half of the GFP signal. And then th- they infect with a pseudovirus with L2 that has the other GFP inserted. Right. And they can reconstitute cytoplasmic fluorescence. Right. And that's, oh, got it. Because yeah, so, the, right. the L2 is sticking out of the endosome into so, the cytosome. Yeah, right. And mm-hmm. it can interact with that uh, the other half of the GFP right. that's in the cytosome. It's like fishing. Right. And then, as you might guess, <laughs> they can replace in the pseudovirus the C-terminal peptide with their various mutants and show that they block right. interaction by blocking um, penetration of the peptide out of the endosome. So they get right. less fluorescence. So direct evidence that the L2 
peptide is required for exposure of the C-terminus because of this nice GFP um, assay. And they also do the whole thing with another serotype of HPV. So they can say this is not just serotype 16. So I get these so there's this <laughs> Go ahead. positively charged sequence on the tail end of the L2 protein. Right. right that which, pokes through the membrane in the endosome. Right. And proximal to that is this retromer binding sequence. So when that thing pokes through, it puts the retromer binding sequence in the cytoplasm where retromer can bind it. Mm -hmm. And that binding mm -hmm. then drags the whole endosome. That's right. Uh, to the TGN. Uh, to, the trans, to the trans Golgi network. Now, right. the other thing they say is that at the end terminus of the L2 protein is a sequence that could at least theoretically, act as a transmembrane domain. That's so right. it's as if right, right. the C-terminus sneaks through and it's sliding through until it hits that N-terminal transmembrane domain that <laughs> then locks it down on the membrane. Mm -hmm. Right. In their little cartoon, they have the L2 actually still attached to the virus particle. And I don't know if that's known or not, Mm -hmm. Or if it's even necessary. You might not need it, it right? Yeah. You might right. not yeah. need it. Because if you got an endosome yeah, yeah, with yeah. this now transmembrane uh, protein on it that will drag the endosome to the TGN, I don't know that L2 still has to be yeah. attached to the particle or not. Either way, I mean, it doesn't matter. And this right, so what's happening here, if you think about the <clears throat> logistics inside the cell, there are these vesicles that get sent around to different places. And some of them are going to the outside of the cell. And some of them are going to back to the inside to get recycled to the nucleus or recycle the lipids. HPV binds its receptor, gets internalized into an endosome. And then this L2 um, is the shipping label. Yeah. And normally, normally. Cell or a vesicles, sorting sequence. <laughs> right. The yeah. sorting sequence. The, the cell vesicles will all have their shipping labels on them. And these proteins like retromers will see, will recognize the label that says, take this back toward the, the nucleus, toward the transgolgi and the nucleus. Um, L2 is a label that says, take this vesicle that way. The retromer binds and hauls it back or gets hauled back uh, exactly where HPV needs to go. And all this to avoid the innate immune mm -hmm. response against exactly. double-stranded DNA. Exactly. You don't want well, to come yeah. out before. Because so this, this, this whole vesicle, the endosome, will then fuse with the TGN, and then right. the... Right. Virus is shielded from the cytosol. So right. we owe a lot of this to Gunter Blobel also, I bet. Why? Because he studied trafficking at this level very heavily. He did. He did. So uh, one of the things I like about this is that it it's uh, a way of turning a soluble protein into a transmembrane protein. Yeah, that's what they call it. Because yeah. the, yeah. Inducible because the transmembrane domain <laughs> is uh, ordinarily not doing anything. It's, I don't yeah. know even right. in the structure where it is, whether it's internal or not. Yeah. Yeah. But the act of threading this thing using the uh, cell-penetrating peptide, threading it through the membrane, then uh, in effect exposes or activates, if you like, the transmembrane domain that then locks it into the membrane. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 there is, I mean, there are proteins that get, um, I mean, there are, a lot of membrane proteins are inserted into the membrane co-translationally. Right. right, ribosomes right. are yep. sitting on rough end endoplasmic reticulum, and the proteins are threaded through the membrane and locked into a transmembrane domain during synthesis. This is a way of doing it post-synthesis, and I think there there must be known examples of that happening. Mm -hmm. There are known examples of it happening, um, but it's usually still pretty immediately post-translational. Mm -hmm. um, they mention that there are some cellular proteins that seem to have these same types of domains, and I would love to know more about what's going on with the cell biology of those cell mm -hmm. proteins. Yeah, this is a way of, uh, you know, uh, uh, programming transmembrane potential way downstream. You can mm -hmm. make this yeah. thing and use it as a transmembrane uh, uh, protein some sometime later. That's right. Amazing. Yep. And they say that well, with all the different papillomaviruses, each one has a slightly different, they say hundreds of sequences that can be used for wow. carrying cargo into cells. It's pretty cool. Yeah, well. do, now, do they all go to the TGN or do some of them go to other compartments of the cell? Um, 
I don't think anyone's looked at all of them, right? <laughs> but I think the assumption is they they probably do, but who knows, right? Yeah. Uh, so are, are any of you guys uh, into enough uh, cell biology to tell me what happens after the TGN? I was going to ask you half, that. We're, we're only, only halfway, halfway there. to the nucleus. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> pro you know, from the TGN, you got to go to the ER, right? Yep. Yeah. So presumably vesicles are involved in that. Yeah. Maybe it so, just I mean, takes you, an injury. You, so you go from the TGN back to the the sort of middle GN to the cis Golgi to the yeah. ER. Yeah. And then once you're at ER, then you could access nuclear pores, right? Yeah, because the and Golgi there's is transport, it's there's transport vesicles and proteins associated with all of oh, those yeah. transfer. Yes. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. People make a living on those, too. Amazing. Yeah. So no, at some point, be the, the retromers are not in the picture after that. And then right. some other protein yeah. takes over and maybe recognizes the same motif. I maybe. would presume so, that so, I would so, presume yeah. that the same siRNA knockdown experiments may be revealed. Some of those. Yes. Now, if I'm not mistaken, retromers, they say it's a trimer of three proteins with the names of VPS vacuolar protein sorting. And they were all originally defined in yeast as genes involved in sorting pathways. So right. some of those may also be downstream of the TGN. I wouldn't be surprised. Right. And then they were, the, the, the orthologs were then found in mammalian cells. Yeah. So or another, cells, another mammalian thought cells. that occurred to me while I was reading this, because I wasn't obviously as savant uh, with regards to all the nuance of, of inter, inter, intracellular trans, transportation was to think of this as a long view of a drone looking down on a city and observing uh, the waste disposal systems. You have a solid waste disposal and a liquid waste disposal, and you have to have different carting mechanisms for handling different sizes of packages. And you, and and you know, there's some similarities here. There's some analogies that you can draw here that it's really incredible when you think about what a cell has to do. And then when you think about what a city has to do, it's not different. And and then you've got all the ubiquitin type stuff that goes on too, right? So mm -hmm. you've got to handle, you, you've got to manage a, a dynamic system that when you look at it, you know, like when you're just beginning your cell biology experience as a student, it looks static. You take a look at a cell and it's got a nucleus, it's got a mitochondria, it's got a Golgi, and it doesn't look like anything is actually doing anything. And then you start to look at all the stuff that goes on inside and your mind goes crazy trying to figure it all out. I don't know how you people keep it straight. <laughs> I'm serious about this because, you know, when I encountered this at first as a student and then later on in life as, as this stuff started to evolve into much more complexity than it was to begin with, it's, it's very difficult for someone not involved in this to keep up. But if you start to make analogies between things that you're familiar with, like the way garbage is handled, for instance – Probably most people don't even realize how that works. And then the other thing about sticking this little thing up inside the cytoplasm to attract something to it, I kept seeing an image of an anglerfish sitting down in the deep, 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 well, <laughs> <laughs> abyss right. of the ocean. It's okay. And it they've works. got this yeah. little thing at the end of it that yeah, lights yeah, up. It works. It's actually got green fluorescent protein at the end of its little angling thing, and it attracts victims to it. And, of course, they drag it into their mouth. They don't get dragged into a, 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 a safe house. But this is really, you know, you could write science fiction on this and, and teach normal cell biology using these ways of looking at the way the cell works. Yeah, you could. I'm Many quite, people do. Many people I am do. quite uh, taken with this. Good ones work really well. They have to be good, though. They do have right? to be good. That's right. The other thing I like about this is that there are, aside from DeMaio, there are four authors. So there's a lot of work here, and four people Lots. did it. It's not 20 yeah. people. or Don't they have to know. say how much each one contributed? Well, you know, I was just looking at that, and they don't really divide. I would like them to have divided up <laughs> the projects, because they're clearly divisible projects in yeah, this paper, right? 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 But they only say who did the experiments and the editing. And I like right. funding acquisition. Funding acquisition. <laughs> <GD>. <laughs> That's got to be the senior. That's pretty funny. But, you know, they we say. Did, we, did, we did mention all the authors, didn't we? We did. We <laughs> yes. did. A good job, everybody. Really nice. Absolutely. Yeah. Really nice. Lovely paper. Yeah, I'm looking forward to your next paper. Okay. We have another more. week, another time that my students are very sad that I read the paper and now I'm coming to them with a list of experiments that I think we should do. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Good so for you. They're gonna tell you at one point, could you please not do that show anymore? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, enough of those. Enough, enough, of, uh, enough of that podcast. That's we have one email from God, from Richard. 
who uh, says, I was just listening to the latest TWIV and wanted to raise several points that I think are interesting about mitochondria. The 37 genes you refer to are for humans, as I understand it. There is some variation. And plant mitochondrial DNA can be a lot longer. Correct. There has been reports of a 14th human mitochondrial protein, humanin, encoded in the 16S gene. I don't think we know its function yet, although it has been implicated in one form of Alzheimer's. Finally, most interestingly, there can be more than one type of mitochondria in a person, although rare. The last czar famously had heteroplasmy, as did his brother, which helped to identify his remains. Mm. Many thanks for the interesting podcast. Cheers, Rich, Seven Oaks, Kent, England. Cool. Thank you. I find it interesting that that he addressed us as guys. Guys, yeah. Because I thought (laughs) the English people had an aversion to the name Guy because of Guy Fox. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Mitochondria, very interesting. We're getting close to the 5th of oh, November, are. aren't we? Very interesting. We are. We are getting very close. Okay, let's do some picks. Brianne, what do you have for us? Um, we were on break earlier this week, and so I headed into New York City um, to you the museum. You didn't visit. And you, you didn't, didn't say hello. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's right. Well, I, I, went soup. To the, <laughs> I went to the Museum of the City of New York oh, yeah. on the other side of the park um, and saw an exhibit called Germ City, Microbes and the Metropolis. And this is an exhibit that talks all about uh, – microbes in New York City, how different uh, parts of the city infrastructure are um, designed to do trafficking or tracking and investigation um, and talking about some important outbreaks in the history of New York. Um, There's a little video at the beginning that talks about um, sort of outbreaks and social issues that's really fascinating. And they have a lot of uh, interesting objects to look at. They have an iron lung. and a lot of other things. So it was a really nice exhibit to see. And I thought that it was a nice thing for everyone in the public to see uh, their cool. microbes. Yeah, museums Very. Museums are good ways to reach a lot of people. Yes. As I learned at the Smithsonian. Millions and millions of people. It's very cool. Alan, what do you have for us? I have um, the Nikon 2018 Small World in Motion competition. Excellent. We just got through a paper that had a lot of really cool pictures, and these are a lot of really cool videos. So when you're uh, sitting around looking for something to do, make sure you've got a good bandwidth connection and load these up at high resolution, and and some of them are just gorgeous. Nice. Nice. Beautiful. Actually, most of them are gorgeous. (laughs) They all are. (laughs) That's right. You bet. Fabulous. Rich Condit. Uh, So I don't know what I was doing when I ran across this, (laughs) but... Uh-huh, the uh, <laughs> um, I ran across ion torrent sequencing, which is a um, uh, uh, modern method for sequencing DNA, and I didn't know what it was, so I looked for a video that would describe it to me, and so I've linked to the video, and I'm just aghast at this whole thing. I would agree. It's uh, this is a, a method that uses a microchip. <laughs> that basically has millions of little wells into which are inserted individual distributed individual beads that have bits of DNA that are amplified onto them. And then the whole chip is flooded sequentially with different uh, nucleotide solutions and polymerase so that you can may or may not incorporate a base at a time. And if you incorporate a base, it liberates a proton and actually each well can register a pH change that tells you whether or not the, B, uh, the uh, uh, base has been incorporated. And then all of this stuff is collated. Millions of wells on this little teeny chip, each one doing a polymerase reaction and recording a pH change, whether or not it happens. My mind is blown. Yeah, me too. I watched okay. that same video, Rich, and I asked you before we went on the air, and I'll ask you again, or I'll ask anybody, how does this get recorded? <laughs> what detects I have no the idea. pH? And then electronically. Yeah, no. <clears throat> P- pH changes are easy to detect <clears throat> electronically because they change the conductivity of the solution. No, I got it. But think of millions of wells. Yeah. And half of them go on. Right. What's what's so, the detecting system underneath? It's a computer chip. Uh, it's, it's something that knows where every yeah, so in fact pixel when you're, is. The 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 miracle of 
of is it your a color change? iPhone and your no, it's an electrical change. An electrical change. So you can you can run wires in these vanishingly small traces, these microscopic wires. traces, and That's you can wire. have transistors under them, and you can shrink this down. And this is the this is the the magic of the computer revolution is that we can build these incredibly complex circuits into chips. Mm. Um, so you can have a circuit that detects the change in each of these individual millions of wells. You have a million just, wires attached to this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. They're not wires, actually. They're traces what? on a chip, but yeah. they're, it's what, they're in there. Oh, they're, what, they're a track. I see. Yeah, it's what processors, oh, okay, okay. modern processors okay, have okay, okay. millions and millions. It's right. etched. Right. It's etched, yeah. It's etched. Okay. Right. They, they don't have you soldering each one on. <laughs> no. <laughs> a little tiny, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but this is, uh, as one of the, people who commented here this really makes it so easy to understand you know things like this rather than right, just saying yes. them and, and you know, i would definitely show this in a class but you have to realize it's not easy to make these it's hard to do these videos I'm sure. I, I know i i sent this uh, video to uh, my buddy ed niles because he and i i don't know what is it now 30 35 years ago sequenced a chunk of dna using the some of the initial uh, <laughs> methods and he wrote back and he said we were flying a World War One biplane, and these guys were flying an <laughs> Airbus, right? That's right. Totally, That's totally. Right. <laughs> so I sequenced the whole genome of polio on my own. It's my Maxim Gilbert, right? Maxim Gilbert. It took me a year to <laughs> yes. do both strands. I had 2X coverage. And today you could do it in 30 minutes. So, you know. But actually, I, that, that length of of a sequence you could do in a matter of seconds on your way yeah, to sequencing exactly. something much bigger. Oh, yeah, sure. Right. The thing is that when I did it, we said, wow, here's the sequence, and we're going to study this one sequence yeah, for right, the rest right. of our exactly. life. But now you could get billions of sequences, and that's what made evolution possible yeah. study. Oh, it's just right. amazing. It's just amazing. I would agree entirely. Dixon, what do you have? Well, I have the uh, Nobel Prize winners in econ economics for this year, and they both got the prize. One's at Yale, one's at uh, NYU. <clears throat> and they both study the economics of climate change from various perspectives. And the one at Yale, I believe, uh, looked at the uh, the investment, a, a small, small investment in something that would change very slowly over time, but was linked to climate change. And you could actually say that that small investment would have had an enormous impact over, let's say, a 20-year period. And it it wouldn't have been able to be possible unless climate change was occurring. That was the kind of investment that you had to make. And there's a model for that. The other one, though, linked the entire Earth's <laughs> economic systems to climate change and said that we're heading in a horrible direction. And if we don't do something very, very soon or yesterday even, uh, the world is – probably going to be a different place forever so dixon tell me uh, the, the current epa doesn't care and and is, is reversing policies that would mitigate climate i wouldn't change. condemn the entire epa for that well i, I won't condemn everyone the but head of, the as head a of. as a department or agency that's the trend and right? there's no science advisor anymore for and so what can we do because here we have nobel prizes given for this well, i'm popularizing that on purpose in fact to I'm say that people are listening to this are already converted <laughs> they would convert yeah. the, all right preaching to the converted but nonetheless i think when you when you talk about something like this openly from an economic standpoint that should impact a lot of so is it correct to say that it's economically a bad policy to ignore Climate change. If you put your head in the sand, you'll die. Because the short view is that oh, it costs companies money to keep the, the climate change down, so we're not going to do it. But did that's short-sighted, right? Did, that's yeah, it's very saying. short. Right? Have you seen the stock market over the last Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's tanking, well, that's yeah. nothing to do with um, that's climate some, change. That's something else. Yeah. The, <laughs> well, the, it's got something I to do with economics. Come on. Something, something very persuasive <laughs> about uh, the status of climate change is one organization that has been taking this very, very seriously for quite a few years now is the pentagon that's right the military huh. that's exactly they right. are they are very intent no on question. anticipating the the <clears throat> impacts of climate change sure. on their operations and on the threats facing the united states 100%. and and they are not an organization that goes in for a lot of touchy-feely liberal stuff usually that's right this is not an ideological thing. <laughs> this is very true. No. They're, they're using biofuels for military now. And they're thinking about inserting vertical farms, by the way, as a And concerned food. about the kinds of threats that are going to arise as sea levels go up. That's and, right. Yeah. That's right. The Navy is very happy about that, by the way. Uh, kind of, <laughs> in some ways. Yeah. <laughs> the Air Force, perhaps, too. Kathy, what do you have for us? I picked something that's uh, quite a bit older, and that is the Spillhouse Projection, which is a world map that 
focuses on the oceans. And this was prepared by this guy who I'd never heard of, Athelstan Spilhaus. <laughs> um, uh, and he pr- produced this map in 1942, showing the world's oceans as one body of water. And then he also did several other really interesting things. He's responsible for the skyways in Minneapolis. It's 11 miles worth <laughs> of right. these uh, things that connect the buildings, buildings, which is really convenient in the wintertime. Uh, he also uh, directed the U.S. exhibit at the 1962 World's Fair in Seattle. And JFK said, the only science I ever learned was from your comic strip. <laughs> so. <laughs> Anyway, just an cool. interesting person, but I just like looking at this map, too. It's That's very cool. Fascinating. Really Kathy, cool. have you ever looked at the map of the Earth from uh, Buckminster Fuller's perspective? Oh, that, I think I have, yeah. It, it connects yeah. all the continents yeah. together, so there's only one land mass, and there's only one ocean, basically. Mm-hmm. So that's the way it all mm. shakes out. Mm-hmm. Very interesting, huh? My pick is from the podcast called Intelligence Matters, which I've been listening to. It is hosted by Michael Morell, who was the former acting associate director of the CIA, I think, something like that. Anyway, he's, um, he's he knows what he's talking about when it comes to national security. He interviews a lot of interesting people. And this particular one, he interviewed Tony Fauci, I was I played it the other day, and I hear this really strong Brooklyn accent. I go, "Who's this guy?" And then he starts talking about nature being the biggest bioterrorist. I go, "Oh, that's got to be Tony Fauci," and it was. <laughs> and it's a really interesting uh, interview because you know Michael Morell comes from a different perspective as Rich and I when we interviewed Tony many years ago, and it's just it's interesting to uh, hear what he has to say. And I really like when Morell says. Do you worry about bioterrorists making an organism from scratch? And Fauci goes, well, that would be pretty hard to make it from scratch. You could modify one. But he said, really, what I worry about is nature. (laughs) And it's great because he knows how to talk because he's dealing with Congress all the time. So Mm. worth like that. The actual podcast is pretty good overall, but this one is the one I want to pick. And then we have a Gonzalo listener pick, or I should say a listener pick from Gonzalo. From Gonzalo. Hello. Hello. I'm a biology student at the University of Tsukuba, Japan, and I've been listening to the show for a long time now. So the reason for me writing to you guys for the first time are, first, I want to thank all of you for the time you take to make this incredible show. I've been very interesting and useful to learn about the newest topics, which are not covered in class. Also, I want to thank Brianne for uploading her immunology course. Since watching Vincent's, I've been wanting to find a similar one regarding immunology. I just started listening, but I'm sure I'll enjoy watching all of them. Second, probably you've been suggested this before or not, but here in Japan, (laughs) there's an animated show that all my biology classmates, and me included, really like. It is called Cells at Work or Hataraku Saibu in Japanese and is about how cells work inside the body. Most of the episodes are focused on the immune system, so if not for TWIV, I think it could be a pick for immune. Thanks again for all your work. And so he didn't send a link, but uh, I found a wiki entry for the anime, uh, actually the manga, the printed series. The Japanese manga series written and illustrated features the anthropomorphized cells of a human body with two the two main protagonists being a red blood cell and a neutrophil. It's <laughs> <laughs> great. And they just made an anime which was released on July 2018. And so I put a link to the Crunchyroll page. For, for those of you who know anime, you know Crunchyroll. And you can actually watch Cells at Work. This is cool. Very cool. <laughs> yeah, this is this is great, and I'm so glad to hear Gonzalo likes the course. Yes. Um, is this in English or Japanese? Uh, well, if it's on Crunchyroll, it would probably be subtitled. Okay. And I sent it to my son who who studies Japanese, and my son can watch a subtitled anime and say, Dad, that's not what they're saying. <laughs> I really think that's so cool. So I sent him this and I said, tell me what you, but he won't respond because he doesn't answer my text. You know, your kids never answer your text. <laughs> they do when you want money. All right. This, does, this does seem to be, I just um, went into the hemorrhagic shock one um, <laughs> and uh, they, they do seem to have subtitles. 
Ah, yeah. most of them. So most of them, they're all, most of them are produced in Japan. Right, they're big into it, and then they're sure. released there. Sure, and then sure. at some point, Crunchyroll or Funimation or one of these channels yeah. will bring them over here, and then they yeah. subtitle them, okay. which is fine because dubbing is just ridiculous. You don't get the original intonation and all I of that, not. you know. But the only problem is you end up looking a lot at the subtitles and you miss yeah. you miss the action. But exactly. yeah, that's the way it is. Learn Japanese. So my son does. He said he practices his Japanese by watching anime. Oh, good idea. He's he's um he's watched billions and billions <laughs> as far as I can tell. <laughs> All right, Twiv five one five. You can find them at Apple Podcasts, microbe.tv slash twiv. Most of you listen on a phone or a tablet, you have an app that you love. Please subscribe so you get every episode and we get number credits. And as I always say, I always mean to say this at the beginning of the show. Um, if you uh, listen on Overcast, which is a podcast player that Kathy and I use. We're not talking about the weather now. <laughs> no, isn't that a clever name for a podcast player? It is. Player? It's yeah, name. it's a great name. Um, there, there, when you go into the list of your podcasts, each podcast has a little I um information thing next to it or there's a star at the bottom just hit the star and that says you're favoriting it you could do it for each episode and that the reason i would like you to do that is so the more people do that we get pushed to the top of lists so overcast for example if you say let's let me find a new podcast uh, it will give you these categories and one of them is science and medicine and they have i don't know 40 podcast and we were never on it now twiv is, is the last second to last i'll send you guys uh, kathy you wanted a screenshot i'll show you this yeah. oh no i know how See to do it? it i just need to be reminded every time so this is good <laughs> so we got twiv there so it's second which is good um you know and we're on moving this up. Page, we're moving there's up. some good i mean you got uh <laughs> what's his name uh um, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Thank you very much. Cool. <laughs> I was looking for it. Yeah. And you have, yeah, Star Talk Radio, you Bill have Radio, Nye? Radio Lab. No, Bill there's Nye? no Bill Nye. I don't really? think he has a podcast, does he? This video know. stuff. Uh, what else is on here? Uh, Science Friday. The Infant Monkey Cage is apparently very popular from BBC Radio, Scientific mm -hmm. American. And then we have This Week in Virology. So we're like the only independently. <laughs> produced everybody else's big money so that's cool is it on kind of cool too because the they it makes gold stars beside your episodes yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's nice so <laughs> please do that if you listen to overcast on overcast if you have another podcast player and there are tons find out how to favorite or recommend ours we really could use that to get more and more listeners because we want more people as we said before to listen about science at least the kind of science we talk about and if you really like what we do, please support us financially. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Some of you have started to do this. We really appreciate it. Um, and the rest of you, you could do it too. A buck a month? Yeah, no problem. Dixon de Pommier can be found at trichinella.org and thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. Brian Barker is on Twitter at bio. Prof Barker. She's at Drew University. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks for having me. I had a great time. Kathy Spindler's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. And Rich Condit, former, he's actually an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. You just dodged a bullet. Just man. dodged a bullet. <laughs> Currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Did, did Gainesville get hit? I guess, yeah. Uh, they dodged a bullet. They did. They it was yeah. a, just barely grazed. Like the the eye is that why or something or uh, no? Just they missed were them. A, a fair distance away. Oh, they were. Panama City yeah. got creamed. Panama City got creamed. That's in Florida. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Good. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque dot com. He's on Twitter as Alan Dove. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Alan was tweeting at seven a.m. this morning. Oof. Yes. <laughs> 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 and I it was, was watching him sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks to ASM for their support and music by Ronald Jenkins. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIB is viral.